Number 10. We're starting off strong with The Devil Made Me Do It case. If you're a fan of Ed and Lorraine, you know this one. The Devil Made Me Do It case is arguably one of the most famous cases that Ed and Lorraine ever worked on. But beyond the supernatural, this case was right in the public eye. Not only were there demons and the supernatural, but the scrutiny of the public eye made this a whole different monster for the Warrens. A bunch of people outside of the courthouse making claims and threats over the case isn't easy to deal with. When 19-year-old Arne Cheyenne Johnson took the life of his landlord and blamed it on the devil, Ed and Lorraine jumped to his defense. They were convinced a demon had entered him after he tried to save his brother from a vicious possession a year earlier. His younger brother was possessed by 43 demons and Arne commanded that they leave him and enter him instead. The Warrens fell under immense scrutiny, but according to them, the court the court had defended accounts of God in the past, now it was time to defend accounts of the devil. But one thing remains strange to me. Arn was never exercised after the event. Does that mean they are still with him? Number 9. Highgate Cemetery where were they for the vampire hysteria at Highgate Cemetery? Like, where were you? When I learned about this case, I was flabbergasted, and it's weird to me that they weren't there. They've dealt with werewolves, but missed out on vampires completely? The Highgate Cemetery in London, England has some of the oldest graves in the world, making it the perfect breeding ground for ghosts, ghouls, goblins, and vampires. Ooh, it's spooky season. The Highgate vampire case caused a media uproar in the 60s that culminated in two magicians, magicians, facing off to see who could catch the vampire first. It all started when two girls reported seeing the dead rise from the graves while walking through Swain Lane one night. Soon, animal carcasses drained of blood started turning up. Newspapers had their cameras ready. A massive vampire hunt was organized on Friday, April 13th, Friday the 13th, in 1973. And bodies were even exhumed from their graves to see if they were toothy. Sadly, no one caught anything, but the case still sends a tingle down the spines of vampire enthusiasts around the world. Legends of the demon, though, continue along with sightings of a crazed old woman and corpses appearing in places they shouldn't be. Number 8. The Bell Witch I searched the internet far and wide to see if the Warrens had ever visited the Bell Farm, but alas, no. If I'm wrong and I missed something, post a link down in the comments because I'm not perfect and maybe I missed it. But as far as I can see, they never actually checked out one of the most famous hauntings in the world. 200 years later, the Bell Cave remains an attraction and many still report hearing a shrill, scratchy voice when no one is around and see orbs surrounding the farm, or where it used to stand. Though the actual events happened well before the time of the Warrens and the farm was torn down, the Bell Cave was still there. If there was any duo who could have proven the tale of the Bell Witch, it was them, but maybe, just maybe, they were afraid of what they might find. Number 7. Michael Taylor the Michael Michael Taylor case is one of the strangest I've ever come across while doing lists like this, and it certainly needed Ed and Lorraine. The horrifying events of Michael Taylor happened in the 1970s, specifically 1974. A man who was considered a good husband, father, and community man suddenly flipped. He began enduring bouts of severe depression and was visiting a 21-year-old pastor named Marie Robinson for counsel. His wife was obviously suspicious, but the sessions were helping. Mary allegedly performed many exorcisms on him to expel the demons. Taylor's wife was getting pretty antsy and they ended up having a confrontation during which Taylor attacked his wife. It was after this moment Taylor resolved to undergo a full-blown exorcism on October 5th, 1974. During this, Michael had seizures, he spit and bit the ministers and screamed in tongues. Unfortunately though, it did not expel all the demons and Taylor returned home in a rage. He took the life of his wife in an incredibly gruesome way and was later found screaming in the street naked and covered in blood. I don't I don't think the Warrens ever encountered anything as violent, but imagine if they did. Number six, Richard Gallagher and Julia. Richard Gallagher is a man I find entirely fascinating because his transition from being a man of science to a full on believer of the occult is, for lack of a better word, insane. Now, obviously, the Warrens had their domain, but imagine if these guys collaborated on this case? What? Though, I don't know if Gallagher needed the help. Just saying. The case I'm referring to is when Gallagher encountered a transformative possession. Gallagher became the go-to guy to diagnose people who claimed to be possessed. An Ivy League psychiatrist, he would help those who were mistaking mental illness for something mystical. Julia was the first time he encountered someone he couldn't explain. Julia 
Julia was the queen of a satanic cult and had become possessed, which she desperately wanted to be rid of. Skeptical at first, but when Richard sat down to talk to her, she knew intimate details about his life. Objects would fly off the wall, and once during a phone call with the priest, they both heard one of the demonic voices she'd speak in around them, even though Julia was across the country. Number five, the Thornton Heath Poltergeist. It was the 1970s. A. Thornton Heath, England. Where were the Warrens? Probably busy or too scared to bother with such a terrifying case. It all started one hot August evening when the family living in the house was awoken by their radio suddenly blaring to life. This was just the beginning to a terrible haunting the family would endure for four years. Objects would fall or be thrown across the room by invisible hands, you know, all the usual poltergeisty things. One night, the son awoke to find a man standing at the end of his bed, like staring at him with like venom in his eyes. After a bunch of startling incidents, they tried to have the house blessed but it failed. However, a medium did discover that the house was haunted by a couple named the Chattertons, the Chattertons who considered them trespassers on their property. The family eventually had no other option but to move out and the activity has since ceased. But imagine if the Warrens were on the case, probably would have been solved so much sooner or not, who knows. Number four, the Danny Poltergeist case. In 1998, a woman named Jane Fishman reported strange happenings regarding an antique bed in the home of Al Cobb in Savannah, Georgia. It was a vintage 1800s bed that Cobb bought at auction for his son, a purchase he later regretted. Three nights after it was purchased, Jason, the son, told his parents that someone was watching him on the bed. He felt cold breath on his neck and saw the impressions of elbows dipping into the pillow. He also noticed the photo of his deceased grandparents lying face down on the dresser, which became a reoccurring event after he put it back up, it fall back out. But then one morning, an assortment of strange objects, including animals made from shells, was found on his bed after he'd already gone down to breakfast. That got his parents and his twin brother's attention. They left paper and crayons out and asked the ghost what his name was. Then later they came back to see Danny Seven written on the paper. After several communications and a smashed terracotta planter, it was clear that Danny didn't want anyone in his bed. The family eventually got rid of the bed, but that didn't solve the problem. Turns out Jason's connection to the spirits went skin deep and he continued to see things after the event. Number three, here we go. The Winchester House. This place is on my bucket list to visit, so it's a wonder to me why the Warrens never checked it out. Again, I googled it, they didn't. Prove me wrong in the comments. I welcome correction, as always, thank you. But it's essentially a 24,000 square feet mansion with 10,000 windows, 2,000 doors, 160 rooms, 52 skylights, 47 stairways and fireplaces, 17 chimneys, 13 bathrooms, six kitchens, and cost Sarah $5 million to build, about $71 million today. There are stairs and doors that lead to nowhere, windows that don't open. It's a labyrinth of mystery. Sarah Winchester and her husband, William Winchester, amassed a huge fortune from their sale of the, you guessed it, Winchester rifle. After her daughter died of TB and William left Sarah a widow, she consulted a medium who told her that she would constantly be haunted by the spirits killed by the Winchester rifle. The house never stopped construction until she died in 1922. It is said the house was built to trap the spirits inside. Today, it's considered one of the most haunted places in the world and is well worth a visit for anyone seeking a scare. So where the heck were the Warrens to debunk this thing? It would've been awesome. Number two, the Amityville Horror Case. Obviously, I had to put this case on the list because this case remained the scariest event of Ed and Lorraine's career. It had the monstrosities of the night which roamed that house, which infested it, which caused a young man to murder his whole family. The events at Amityville, Long Island in 1975 shook the nation and the box office. The Lutz family moved into their dream suburban home with optimism and hope for their life. But little did they know, a year earlier, Ronald DeFia Jr. shot and killed all six members of his family, priming the property with evil. The Lutzes didn't know what to make of the swarms of flies, loud, aggressive banging noises, disturbing entities, and even levitations occurring in the home. So so they got the hell out of Dodge, leaving all their belongings in the process. When they finally called the Warrens in, George Lutz, the father who was, by the way, an ex-Marine and karate expert, literally supposed to be fearless, wouldn't even meet them at the house. They met at a pizza hut. But as soon as the Warrens began working on the case, they understood why. The Amityville case affected our personal lives 
more than any case we ever worked on. To this day, Lorraine says that this is the case that haunts her the most and said that she hoped this was the close to hell as she would ever get. So if that's not too scary, I don't know what is. And now we are getting to number one, the Warrens. Demons, poltergeists, and ghosts. It was hard to find a case that the Warrens wouldn't face. They seemed fearless, their love strong enough to withstand all the forces of darkness, or at least that's how the movies told it. It turns out that the real case the Warrens were too afraid of was the horrifying truth of their marriage. Yup, we're going there. If you're a fan of the movie franchise, then you know that Lorraine had a lot of influence on the stories up until her death. But a weird detail in her contact alludes to some nefarious activity in their personal life. Neither Ed or Lorraine Warren could be depicted violating anyone or performing adult acts with a minor. The reason that was in there might have something to do with the case of Judith Penny. Penny stayed with the Warrens as a young woman and allegedly had an inappropriate relationship with Ed and Lorraine knew about it. Judith made a legal declaration in November 2014 stating that Penny and Ed had begun an amorous relationship when he was her bus driver and she moved in with them in 1963. That same year, Penny was arrested when someone noticed the illegal relationship between her and Ed. Why she was arrested and not him remains in question to me, but Penny also stated that Ed was abusive towards Lorraine, saying, and I quote, sometimes Ed would actually have to slap her across the face to shut her up. Some nights I thought they were going to kill each other. Lorraine denied the allegations through representatives and there are still a lot of loose ends, but I suppose whatever happened has already been taken to the grave. Number 10, the Keg Mansion in Toronto. This one's for me, I'm so sorry, but here it is. Tell anyone in Toronto that you're going to the Keg Mansion for dinner. Be ready to receive the, you know it's haunted, right? because they will do that, they will do that, because it is. I have been there on several occasions and I can verify that heading to the upstairs girls bathroom alone is a harrowing journey. The haunting goes back all the way to 1915. Before it was the keg, it was the home of industrialist Hart Massey and his family. Legend has it that the Massey's daughter Lillian passed away and her maid was so distraught over her death that she took her own life, that's one theory. Others say that she committed the act to avoid the dread of her affair with Massey being revealed. Either way, the ghostly image of a maid hanging by the neck has been seen multiple times by employees, I have friends who work there, and guests alike. It's been a keg since the 1970s, and Ed and Lorraine never visited, neither for business or pleasure. There are either two reasons for this, they were too busy, or the idea of a ghostly apparition appearing mid-bite didn't sound very appealing to them. How do you like your spirit? Rare or well done? Number nine, the Myrtles Plantation. This 18th century plantation, along with a 600 acre land, carries with it a dark past. Perhaps it's due to the fact that no one was living in it as to why the Warrens never visited, but the haunting itself is pretty terrifying. Though only one person was confirmed to have been killed on the property, with the history of slavery surrounding the estate, the number is estimated to be a lot higher, as we can probably guess. One of the most famous ghosts who reportedly walks the ground is that of Chloe. Chloe was a slave who poisoned the birthday cake of the daughters of Clark Woodruff to take a small kind of revenge on her awful masters. She apparently didn't intend for the girls to die, only to fall ill, but alas, they died. When they did, her fellow slaves were so fearful of Woodruff finding out that they hung Chloe for her crimes. This tale has fluctuated over the years, but the verified murder was that of William Drew Winter, who was shot on his porch and reportedly crawled back into the house, climbed to the 17th step on the stairs in time to die in the arms of his love. Both tales have sparked sightings of spirits on the ground in Winter's case. Visitors reportedly see and hear bloody footprints crawl to the 17th step and then stop. Had the Warrens visited the property, they could have potentially confirmed what spirits remain restless on the property. But alas, we will never know. Number eight, Velisca Axe House. Adding to this list of properties that make you want to run away is the Velisca Axe House. The story goes as follows. On June 10, 1912, Josiah and Sarah Moore, along with their children, were bludgeoned to death inside their home. But no one knows who did it. It is one of America's most infamous cold cases, and the home remains preserved exactly as it was, except for the bodies, obviously, though many report that their spirits remain. The Warrens never charged for their work. They simply liked helping people because go Warrens. But the people who now run the haunted museum have no problem charging their visitors. The house remains a tourist attraction and there's a steep price to pay should you wish to stay the night. Besides the $400 fee, 
it may cost you your life. Allegedly in 2014, a paranormal reporter stayed at the house and at 12.45 in the morning, the owners got the call. The man was found covered in stab wounds, which authorities later reported were self-inflicted. The Warrens risked their well-being all the time. So my theory is that the investors were the ones that kept them away because they didn't want to scare the ghosts away because they were making them so much money. But you know, it would have been nice to hear their thoughts. Number seven, Los Feliz Mansion. Have you ever entered a room or building that immediately gave you like the heebie jeebies? Like something in your gut was screaming at you that you were supposed to be there? Well, that is the exact feeling people encounter when they stand outside this mansion. On the night of December 6th, 1959, Dr. Harold Perelson snapped and took the life of his wife and eldest daughter before he took his own. His two youngest managed to escape after their eldest sister screamed. He was a successful doctor with a happy family life, so no one knew why this happened. Some blame financial issues after one of his investments failed, but one creepy factor was that a passage from Dante's Divine Comedy was left open on his bedside table like a note. Ever since the event, people report an overwhelming feeling of foreboding that prevents visitors from entering. It was used as a storage unit by a family who purchased it two years after the event, but it was never lived in again. Number six, the Jean Harlow haunting. It sounds like bad luck followed all those who lived in this home. You may have heard of old Hollywood actress Jean Harlow and her horrendously abusive husband, Paul Byrne. In 1932, Byrne took his own life while standing in front of a mirror, though some believe foul play since the butler who found him called MGM Studios first, not the police. Byrne's ex-girlfriend jumped off a boat to her death days later, so there was some speculation if it was her. Jean moved out, but died later at the ripe age of 26, super young. So as you can tell, that house did not have good vibes. But then in 1963, Jay Sabring bought the house with his then girlfriend, Sharon Tate. Tate in a couple interviews recounted events in the house that creeped her out, such as the appearance of a short man, probably Byrne, staring at her in the master bedroom. She also saw a shadowy figure hanging with a slit throat in the hallway. Creepier still, Tate and Sabring would later fall victim to the horrendous and horrific Charles Manson massacres. Tate was the same age as Harlow when she died, also a really creepy coincidence. Something dark clung to whoever lived in the house and is still presumed to be haunted to this day. Number five, 455 Sackett Street. When you think of a haunted house, a specific image appears in your brain. It's either a farmhouse or a mansion. There's really no in between. But you would think we would hear more about haunted apartment buildings since there is a large turnover, which is perhaps why the haunting of 455 Sackett Street didn't get as much attention. This place was riddled with unexplained fires, ominous feelings and sudden drops in temperature, and family tragedies. Everyone who lived there experienced dark things. What with the history of the building being riddled with insidious affairs, mob hits and dealings and grim attacks, bound to happen. Jane, one of the women who lived there, once had a friend see a little boy in burnt rags staring at her. This event proved even more terrifying as after the woman moved out, the apartment was renovated. Within the walls of her apartment, they found a corpse fitting the above description, tucked inside the walls. So if you are ever in Brooklyn, don't request an in-person viewing. The Warrens never did. Number four, Hotel Monte Vista. We all know the idea of a place being haunted is enough to lure in guests, but if guests can't even make it through the night, then there's a problem. And they needed the Warrens, but they never showed up. The Hotel Monte Vista opened as a community hotel in 1927, and soon a history of opium dens, tragic affairs, mob dealings, once again, and secret gambling swelled around the place, as did their paranormal reputation. The hotel has become known for its ghostly sightings, such as in room 220. A Long-term boarder had a strange habit of hanging meat from the ceiling in that room. I don't know why the hotel let them do that. And the lodger himself was found dead three days after his death. The TV allegedly changes channels on its own, and the sheets have been found torn to shreds. In room 210, the small voice of a bellboy announcing room service can be heard, though no one appears. John Wayne even experienced this. In room 306, the corpses of two women of the night were thrown over the balcony. Guests who stay there report feelings of being
being suffocated by hands while they sleep. Staff are plagued by sounds of infants crying in the basement and have been seen running to escape the sound. The list goes on and on. Perhaps it was more the money machine that kept the Warrens away, but it would have been cool to hear their take on the hauntings. Number 3 Pobelia Island There are many reasons why the Warrens never visited this island, the number one being that it's so freaking terrifying it's actually illegal to visit. It's also in Italy, though they traveled all the time, so what's the reason? Pobelia Island Place hosts over 160,000 violent deaths. From being a hospice for victims during the bubonic plague, then an asylum run by a mad doctor, the tormented past of the island has no limits. The story of the doctor on the island is the most menacing though. He performed cruel and malicious experiments on his patients, but their souls took revenge on him and allegedly drove him mad. So mad that he tried to throw himself off of the clock tower. And witnesses say that on the night it happened, a mysterious mist consumed the island. Those who decide to take a boat and venture as close as possible to it report hearing screams and moans that chill the bones. Even creepier, people report hearing a bell toll from across the bay, even though it was removed years before. Scientists who have studied the strange happenings of Povelia have identified an electromagnetic field that surrounds the property, but there's no electricity to the island. So what's the reason? Number two, the Dandy House. This may have been a job too big for the dynamic duo. A dream home turned nightmare, the Dandies experienced some of the most terrifying encounters since the Bell Witch. I said it. Clara and Phil Dandy lived in this house along with their kids in the 1970s and endured all kinds of encounters, from disembodied voices to footsteps racing around the house. It's a wonder they stayed as long as they did. The creepiest thing I saw described is that once they witnessed strange faces watching them through the windows. When Mr. Dandy ran outside to confront them, first of all, brave dude, badass, mad respect, the faces were looking out at him from inside the house. From there, things got worse. Some of the things even sounded like aliens. They saw floating white specters and half animal half human creatures watching them. Objects flew around the room, one lamp barely missed one of their daughters. They involved clergy and Ed and Lorraine to help clear the house, but even they couldn't rid the house of whatever possessed it. In fact, whatever they did made it worse. It got so bad, the dandies ended up leaving the house after nothing worked. And last but not least, the Mothman in number one. The legend of the Mothman, alien, angel, or demon, described as a tall half man, half bird like creature with glowing eyes, the Mothman even has skeptics unsure of what to say. The most famous groupings of sightings occurred between November 15, 1966 to December 15 in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Prophetic in nature, sightings of the creature are often followed by tragic events such as the Silver Bridge disaster. The aforementioned bridge collapsed on December 15, which coincided with the last sighting of the creature. 46 people passed away and because sightings ceased after this, people believe he was an angel of death of sorts. More recently, sightings of the Mothman started taking place in 2011 in Chicago. I know the Warrens strictly dealt with demons and possession, but considering how mystifying this whole event was, it would have been interesting to hear what they had to say.